Good afternoon, good evening, everyone who is on. Welcome to this session of the Oxford Interfaith Forum. My name is Ruben Kriam. I'm a fellow of the Oxford Interfaith Forum, and I'm the co-coordinator of the Ecology and Interfaith Contexts Reading Group. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the host of this session and to introduce you to our chair for today, Professor Karina Hogan. Karina completed her PhD in 2002 at the University of Chicago Divinity School and is now an associate professor in the Department of Theology at Fordham University and the director of the honors program there. So Karina, over to you. Thank you, Ruben. A leader in the field of religious studies with particular scholarly interest in bioethics and Jewish studies, Lori Zoloth's research explores religion and ethics drawing from sources ranging from the biblical and Talmudic texts to postmodern Jewish philosophy, including the writings of Emmanuel Levinas, Hannah Arendt, and Margaret Sussman. Her scholarship spans the ethics of genetic engineering, gene drives, stem cell research, synthetic biology, social justice and healthcare, and how science and medicine are taught. She also researches the practices of interreligious dialogue, exploring how religion plays a role in public discussion and policy. Zoloth is the author of four books, Second Texts and Second Opinions, Essays on Jewish Bioethics, which just came out from Oxford University Press, and Ethics for the Coming Storm, Jewish Thought and Global Warming, which is forthcoming from Oxford and from which this lecture is adapted, Healthcare and the Ethics of Encounter, a Jewish Discussion of Social Justice, and May We Make the World, Gene Drives, Malaria, and the Future of Nature. She's also a co-editor of six books, including Notes from a Narrow Ridge, Religion and Bioethics, The Ethics of Terror, Mistakes in Bioethics and in Medicine, and Jews and Genes, The Genetic Future in Contemporary Jewish Thought. Zoloff has been the president of both the American Academy of Religion and the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and Vice President, for the, and Humanities and Vice president of the Society for Jewish Ethics. She was the director of the Jewish Studies Program at San Francisco State University, and Director of Graduate Studies and Religious Studies at Northwestern. She's an elected member of the Hastings Center and a life member of Clare Hall, University of Cambridge. She was a founding board member of the Society for Scriptural Reasoning, the International Society of Stem Cell Research, and the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. Her work on bioethics and healthcare led her to serve on the NASA Advisory Council, the Space Agency's highest civilian advisory board, the International Planetary Protection Committee, the National Recombinant DNA Advisory Board, and the Executive Committee of the International Society for Stem Cell Research. She served as the chair of the first Bioethics Advisory Board at the Howard Hughes Medical Research Institute, and has testified in front of Congress, the President's Commission on Bioethics, and state legislatures. Zoloff began her career as a neonatal nurse working in impoverished communities. She holds a bachelor's degree in history and women's studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's degree in nursing from the, universe, from the University of the State of New York. She received a master's degree in Jewish studies and a doctorate in social ethics from the Graduate Theological Union. Zoloff also holds a master's degree in English from the San Francisco State University. Prior to joining the University of Chicago, Zoloff served as a Charles McCormick Deering Professor of Teaching Excellence at Northwestern University holding appointments in the Department of Religious Studies in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and in the Feinberg School of Medicine. At Northwestern, she was founding director of the Brady Program in Ethics and Civic Life at the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and the founding director of the Center for Bioethics, Science and Society at the Feinberg School of Medicine. She currently serves on the National Ethics Advisory Board of NASA and the National Steering Committee of the Engineering Biology Research Consortium. She has served as the Dean of the Divinity School and as the Senior Advisor to the Provost on Social Ethics at the University of Chicago. So now I will hand it over to Lori Zoloft. Thank you so much, Karina, for a lavish introduction. <laughs> um, I'm going to start right away and read you a story. I like telling stories um, and hope through this story you'll join me on thinking about how Jewish texts um, can serve as a different sort of source for our thinking about climate change. Part one, I was on the train from Los Angeles to Oakland on the beautiful Pacific Coast starlight, Americans name their trains, because I'm the sort of person that has thought about climate change and so I didn't want to fly or drive. It was a beautiful trip away from the back 
poor and uh, area end of the uh, the metropolis of LA, behind the low browning hills, opening to the glittering silver of the Pacific Ocean and skimming along rickety, impossibly tall wood trestles that hug the palisades to the sea. On the cracked russet seat, leather seat behind me sat a Polish philosopher who taught, he told me, at Copernicus University. We chatted about our students and about life in Poland and Chicago and why we were on the train. We were both pleased to avoid the long drive north and self-righteous about our low carbon footprint uh, along what we hoped and, and, and about what we hoped for when we arrived. The train is a liminal space, neither in the past we had just left or the, the farewells, nor not yet in the future, but in the anticipation of the next step. We pass the coastal hills, which look in winter like worn ch children's stuffies, caramel grasses rub bare in spots, trails of cattle like the trace of fingers down their sides. At lunchtime, we sat, four strangers, the Polish guy, a tiny old man who loved trains and knew the name of every cross-country route, a smiling round-cheeked woman in a new matching top and sneaker shoes from Fresno, who had just retired from the post office, bought the shoes and was off to see the world. There was a white tablecloth and a little menu. Nobody is rich because nobody who is rich takes the train in America. Later, the train ran along the river, scant because of the droughts which always stalk California now. And we passed for hours along the long green ridges of lettuce and artichokes, water spraying above them in arcs, the outskirts of the tough farming town of Salinas, the flat valley, tomatoes under shimmering white plastic, flapping silently as the wind died down and the late winter darkness descended. We were traveling now towards Gilroy, Gilroy garlic capital of the world, and we rose to go again to the dining car. But then the train skidded, shuddering to a stop. It took a very long time to stop. It takes three miles to stop a train. It was not scheduled, and after a few minutes during which the porters on the train rushed past us, we realized that something was very wrong. It turned out we were told, reluctantly, by the nice lady in charge of the coffee in the downstairs cafe, that the train had struck and killed four people. Probably the homeless people, she said, maybe the illegals, she said, who camp near the train tracks. It turned out we were told in a low voice that this was not the first time for the starlight. We told her how sorry we were. We had to wait a long time on the silent shuddering train because it was a Sunday and the county was poor farmlands and pickers, and the coroner was only on call and miles away, and the bodies in terrible pieces. So the philosopher and I talked about moral luck and about how we felt grief and guilt and powerlessness and about what it was to feel those things. Moral luck is an idea from Bernard Williams, who was curious about the problem that so much of our lives, even the lives of rational and good persons, making rational and good choices, was subject to random moments of luck or unluckiness. He said, there has been a strain of philosophic thought which identifies the end of life as happiness, happiness or reflective tranquility, and tranquility is the product of self-sufficiency. What is not in the domain of the self is not in its control, and so it's subject to luck and the contingent enemies of tranquility. Both the disposition to correct moral judgment and the objects of such judgment are, in this view, free from external contingency, for both are, in their related ways, the product of the unconditioned will. Yet, the aim of making morality immune to luck is bound to be disappointed. He took as his example the truck driver whose brakes fail just at the moment a child runs into the street and is killed. We had both read this article, for it is famous, and here we were suddenly the man in the truck. But he protested, we weren't driving, so it's in no way our fault. And yet, and yet, we felt ourselves to be participants, implicated, implicants, more than standers by, because we were the ones with the tickets. The name of this sort of guilt might be being Westerners. When I got home, I checked to see if the story had, as we say, made the papers. I googled, four killed by Amtrak train. What I saw was surprising because there was over a million hits, thousands of stories. And this is because it happens over and over at that particular crossing outside of Salinas. And over and over, a thousand times a year, in the county, in the country, at other crossings, at the margins of cities, and in the green and silent fields along the tracks. So what looked at first like bad luck or chance was not. It was policy. It was, as so many things, indicative of deep structural injustice and deep disregard for the poor, the homeless, the stranger. 
This happens because Amtrak is underfunded and the guardrails are inadequate and the si signal is imperfect. The system's not fully figured out. The station's understaffed. The crossing's not regulated with no provisions for humans who need to move around the land that is crossed by the rails. It happens because there are now large camps of the homeless in our cities and a good place to camp turns out to be quite literally on the wrong side of the tracks, which is where it is dark and flat and abandoned at night. It happens because the signs are all in English, even in the Salinas Valley, where the people that pick your grapes and your lettuce and who do not speak or read in that language live. All of these are things that we could change. But this is not a chapter about railway policy. It is a chapter about global warming and about the task of faith, in particular Jewish thought, in thinking about it. And I'm thinking about the idea of collective responsibility and here, and once here again, because we are Westerners and thus have the tickets, we are on the train, so to speak, speeding along, living our lucky lives in which we think we are making moral choices, but in which we are having dinner at white tablecloths as the land speeds by on tracks across the fields, on the tracks made for speed and not for safety, not for the stranger. To be a Westerner is to be on a train that kills as it goes, in the ordinary way, on every ordinary day, it is to be participant and implicant in global warning. It is the argument of this chapter that to understand this is to take seriously the implication of being a Jew, living a Jewish life in a treacherous time, and perhaps to ask a question about Jewish ethics, which is, in what way do the com commitments of Jewish ethics matter to the rest of the polity? What I want to explore in this chapter is not entirely what to do about global warming, for as I said before, there are many other books that have such lists, but who we are and the sort of moral situation into which we find ourselves. What have we done and what are we doing here? Selves that have been shaped not only by luck, but by text and tradition and the gaze of the others answered and unheard and turned away and turned away from. There was a text, part two, there was a text in the Talmud Bavli that I've long been interested in, or rather I've been interested in one aspect of the text, the most abstract ethical bits, because like so many Talmudic discourses, it seemed to trail off in a confusing and frankly grotesque set of details. But let me present the text as a whole, and you'll understand why it is all important here, even the disturbing parts. It's a text about the dismembered body, a body dismembered by murderous violence. It begins with a comment about an abandoned corpse, and it appears first in Deuteronomy, directly it turns out, after the off-quoted section about not cutting down fruit trees during war. Here's a Deuteronomic text. If in the land that the Lord your God is assigning to you to possess, someone slain is found lying in the open, and the identity of the slayer is not known, your elders and your magistrates should go out and measure the distances from the corpse to the nearby towns. The elders of the town nearest to the corpse shall then take a heifer, which has never been worked, which has never pulled a yoke, and the elders of that town shall bring the heifer down to an ever-flowing wadi, which is not tilled or sown. There, is the wadi, there in the wadi they should break the heifer's neck. The priest, son of Levi, shall come forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord. And every lawsuit in case of assault is subject to their ruling. Then all the elders of the town nearest to the corpse shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the wadi, and they shall make this declaration. Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Absolve, O Lord, your people Israel, whom you redeemed, and do not let guilt for the blood of the innocent remain among your people Israel, and they will absolve the blood guilt. And then the biblical text recounts the subject, returns to the subject of war. When you take the field against your enemies, it goes on. Our section is, seems to be a long interruption of the text about the commandments of a just war, and it's odd because it emerges there because it's not about war at all. The rabbinic discourse of the Mishnah will expand on some of the points, for example, the innocence of the young calf, the innocence of the corpse, the transfer of this innocence to the priests, then all of the elders, then all of the people of Israel. But then the discussion will add trouble and detail, raising issues of collective responsibility, unassigned guilt, and ritual moral action. And finally, the problem of absolution itself, when it might be luck or not that leads to catastrophe or choice. And here's their conversation. Here's the Mishnah in Sota 9. The declaration over the heifer whose neck is broken must be in the holy tongue. As it is said, if the corpse is found in the land, then your elders and judges shall go out. Three used to go out from the high court in Jerusalem, Rabbi Judas says five, as it is said, your elders two, your judges two, and there cannot be a court of an even number, so they add one more. 
If it is found buried underneath a heap of stones or hanging on a tree or floating on the surface of the water, they would not break the heifer's neck, as it says, in the earth, and not buried underneath a heap of stones, etc. If it was found near the border or in a city whose majority of inhabitants were Gentiles, or in a city where there is no court, they would not break the heifer's neck. They don't just measure the distance from the city in which there was a court. If it was found exactly between two cities, both of them would bring two heifers between them. And the words of Abraham Eliezer, Jerusalem does not bring a heifer whose neck is to be broken. If the head is to be found in one place and the body in another place, they bring the head to the body. Then in the words of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Akiva says, they bring the body to the head. From what part of the body do they measure? Rabbi Eliezer says from the navel. Rabbi Akiva says from the nose. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says from the place where he was made a slain person, from the neck. The elders of Jerusalem departed and went away. The elders of that city can bring a heifer which has never been worked, and a blemish does not disqualify it. They bring it down to a hard wadi. Itan is understood hard in the literal sense of hard. Even if it's not hard, it is valid. They break its neck with a hatchet from behind. The site may never be sown or tilled, but is permitted to comb flax and chisel rocks. The elders of that city then wash their hands with water in the place where the heifer's neck was broken, and they say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. But would we really think the elders of a court of justice are shedders of blood? Rather, the intention of the statement is that the man found dead did not come to us for help, and we discussed him without supplying him with food, and did not see him, and we let him go without escort. Then the priest exclaimed, Absolve, O Lord, your people Israel, who you redeemed, and do not let guilt for the blood of the innocent remain among your people Israel. They did not need to say, and they will be absolved of blood guilt. Rather, the Holy Spirit announces to them, When you act in this way, the blood is forgiven you. Somebody is dead. Somebody has killed him and fled, for the word is found slain. There must be blood and a sense of violence. Someone has raised the alarm. It is, after all, the textual middle of a discussion of war, the complete collapse of all human order. The place is desolate, a liminal space, far from habitation and the usual course of human affairs. What is this guy doing out there? The elders and the judges shall go out to see. We imagine, we are to imagine the old men, the ones in nice suits. They go themselves, not the cops or the servants, but the most important fellows in the society. For it's a matter of great importance. They come even from the high court in Jerusalem, and they come prepared to judge, which is why there cannot be an even number because a decision will have to be made. It's a matter of justice and courts. The text then stipulates the courts has to be lying on the ground. It cannot be buried or hidden or floating or hanging for, as we've learned later. These might indicate that the death is an accident, a landslide, a flood, a fall. If it was found near the border or a city where the majority of inhabitants were Gentiles or a city in which there's no court, they would not break the heifer's neck. There are places in the world of the Mishnah where the rule of law seemingly doesn't hold. We will circle back to this, but here the categories are described. We're not talking about the lawless border. We're not talking about Gentile cities because violence and social chaos is imagined to be common there. Here, the body lies in a field near an order the path between two Jewish cities, where justice is the norm, where good elders in good suits and nice people live. There are courts of law, but something has gone terribly wrong. So much so, the elders and priests of both cities bring sacrifices, pulling along the mooing baby calf behind the well-dressed burghers of the city, all the way out to the desolate, muddy place between them, between, say, Salinas and Gilroy. A sacrifice for each city for it's everybody's fault. We'll return to this as well. The mission then turns to the ghastly business of the coroner. The violence is so profound that the parts of the body are scattered, the head severed at the neck and the part of the person scattered so much meat and limbs. And Rabbi Akiba and Rabbi Eliezer have an odd and seemingly petty discussion about whether to bring the head to the body, the body to the head. What possible difference can it make now? For Rabbi Akiba, the head, the face, is the part of the body that matters that was a person and not an anonymous corpse. So the head is to be buried where it lies. It's the last honor, the last shred of dignity to move the body back to it. Of course, when one writes about the face as a Jewish ethicist, one thinks of Emmanuel Levinas, for whom the face as the mark of the vulnerable other was a synecdoche for the call of the other in which the one was fully realized. 
I think, says Levinas, the access to the face is straightforward ethical. You turn yourself towards the other. There is first the very uprightness of the face, its upright exposure without defense. The skin of the face is that which saves most naked, through which a decent nudity. It is the most destitute also. There's an essential poverty in the face. The proof of this is that one tries to mask this poverty by putting on poses, by taking on a countenance. The face is exposed, menaced, as if inviting an act of violence, as if at the same time the face is what forbids us to kill. The face is meaning all by itself. Akiba and Eliezer repeat their positions in the matter of measuring. Measuring the exact distance from the body to the city is critical. It's the last bit of law left after the lawless act, because the guilt will rest on the city closest to the victim. And if it is perfectly equidistant, that must be known as well. Measurement making a clean human line in the abandoned lawless place. But measured from where? Eliezer is back at the very center of the body again, all physicality and natality, the navel. When one measures from there, one can look away. But Akiba measures from the very center of the face. One must get very close to the face to measure in such a way. One must look directly at the particular face. The corpse's killer is unknown, but for Rabbi Akiba, the person will, is still a particular person, as much as one can be alone, nameless, with a nameless killer on a field, on a road between two cities. Rabbi Ben Yaakov, coming later, makes another claim. What matters is the violence, so we measure from the place of slaying the slit throat. We're back to the violent act itself, facing the reality, no metaphysics for Ben Yaakov. The Mishnah tells us that the elders of Jerusalem then leave, presumably because the body is that much closer to that city, and their young calf is brought out, a baby cow, one who's never been used by a person for work, an innocent. And then suddenly, from behind, it is struck at the neck with an ax and killed. In the rabbinic imaginary, it works as a sympathetic ritual. It's sympathetic ritual magic. An innocent person has been killed, maybe struck from behind unawares, and so we'll reenact this with an innocent baby animal sneaking up on it from behind, the men in suits and the judges who wield a hatchet. Let us pay attention to the neck, for the Hebrew term for that particular calf is called the egel arufa, or the beheaded heifer, or literally the calf that got it in the neck. This links the calf to several narratives of failure, of course, and one is meant to think of the golden calf, the calves that pulled the grain of Joseph as a gift to his father, the back of the neck that names Orpah, the daughter-in-law of Naomi, who, unlike the, God, the good girl Ruth, turns from her, and of course, one is to think of the people of Israel, who are frequently described as the stiff-necked people. This calf is killed out of the order of the usual ritual for slaughter, the one that renders the animal kosher, because that is done in the opposite manner, by cutting the juggler vein in the front of the animal, facing it, not bludgeoning it or hacking the head off from behind. The one who got it in the neck, the calf, will atone for the one who got it in the neck, the nameless stranger. The ground is hard. We're meant to be standing on a dry riverbed, a wadi who will never again be used as a field. Food will never emerge from it. It will be unworked just like the calf. It is now a place covered in the blood and ash of the sacrifice, and only dirty work can be done down there where dirty work was done. The site may never be sown or tilled. The ritual has defied the place. Now we're at the center of the rabbinic anxiety. The text is structured as if we are watching the biblically prescribed ritual from off stage. We return to the first premise of the Mishnah, the clarification that the ritual phrase must be said in Hebrew. The declaration over the heifer whose neck has been broken must be in the holy tongue. But why? A voice is recorded as saying, as an aside to us, the reader, is this ritual happening at all? It looks like the elders are expatiating guilt. They're doing a ritual done by guilty people, but clearly they're not the killers of the corpse in the field by the road. These are the nice fellows, well-dressed, civil servants and judges, the powerful leaders, but they are in fact understood as murderers, for they have let a man leave their city and their order and walk alone to his death. Perhaps a hungry, thirsty, desperate man, so desperate as to be out without caution, to walk alone after nightfall, to have no place to go, and so took to the road, a homeless man. He was unseen, like the hundreds who live on the margins of our cities, who sleep by the railroad tracks. The Kohanim, the priests, now newly arrived in the story, now implore God for absolution, and they do so in the name of the entire people. 
You redeemed and did not let the guilt of the blood for the innocent remain among your people Israel, they say. Let us not note that the participation of the priests does not render them impure as death usually does because the burial of the abandoned one is a met mitzvah, another overturning of the usual order of the world. Something terrible has happened and an innocent is dead and the murderer loose in the world. There is no one to pursue. So while no one is guilty of the killing, all are responsible for the abandonment. Here's the term used in tractate um, Semechot. If he is found a met mitzvah, he must attend to him and bury him. What is a met mitzvah? When he who finds the body cries out and the inhabitants of the city cannot hear his voice, but they can hear his voice, it is not a met mitzvah. Let's return to our text and, and, and consider the expansion of the guilt offering. Absolve, O Lord, your people Israel. Note how large is this responsibility. It takes in everyone, all your people Israel, not only the elders or the judges or the priests, not only the people of the city who sent the man by the road out alone, who turned away, who did not see him, everyone who is alive, who has been part of a society that allows the homeless one to be on the road at night, the hunger and the thirsty one to be alone, vulnerable, death coming up unseen behind him, and we are all a part of it. The mission wants the reader to know that it is not the magic ritual, not even the incantation in Hebrew, but the acceptance of responsibility that is valorized, after which God approves. When you act in this way, the blood is forgiven you. There must have been a great deal of blood. The abandoned person must have called out in vain, desperate. The idea of a body out of place, unseen, unheard, evokes horror. There are many comments on this story in the later texts of the Gemara. An example is referred to repeatedly in Agada and Baraitas. In Sota, the conversation then is recorded in the text circles back over and over to this story. In one version, Sota 44 to 47, several issues are raised and considered and compared. The rules about hiddenness, the reference to the rules about hidden, sheaves of wheat left for the poor. Then the question about the unworked calf and the issue of whether the labor disqualifies sacrifice. Then a discussion of exactly how long must must accompany a traveler based on a prior relationship and the organization of the power dynamics between the two in question. Teachers are accorded the longest accompany it by their students. The other is our responsibility, reminds Levinas. His face calls out to us. The face, says Levinas, speaks. The first word of the face is thou shalt not kill. It is an order. There is a commandment in the appearance of the face as if a master spoke to me. However, at the, at the same time, the face of the other is destitute. It is the poor for whom I can do and for whom I, I owe, do all and for whom I owe all. And me, whoever I may be, but as a first person, I am he who finds the resources to respond to the call. But one has to see the other, and that's the trick. And now we're back from the fields outside Jerusalem and the fields outside Salinas, California. And I want to return to the problem of unseen faces and the rush of the train and the question of guilt, especially for all the people of Israel, the people who the priests are considering and that for which God absolves us. One of the problems with a changing climate is precisely this. We cannot see the face of the people who will be first affected and most affected. In the other chapters of this book, I detailed the situation of immigrants and of women in the poorest regions, but in every city, at the margins of every place and town and village and spaces between, there will be actual people who are violently killed by the violence that is global warming. This would seem far-fetched. I have told you two stories, both about the deaths of the destitute and unknown, both about the problem of guilt without assailants. In both cases, I'm suggesting a way to think rather than a direct response or the use of the complex biblical and Mishnaic text in a fessel manner to create a norm or prove a point. These are discussions are about the difficulty of judgment, and they are useful when we consider the difficult problem of responsibility for acts for which no one is directly responsible, in which one is simply on the train, more than a bystander, but not a perpetrator. The whole of the people Israel needs the sacrifice of blood to expatiate the blood of the abandoned one. We all, who are not the bad guys, who have not made the vast profits or ordered the rainforest plowed to rubble, who don't pass laws to allow extraction, but we are, we Westerners, we are those who participate in the not seeing of the outcome of the actions that we do. In my next chapter of this book, I'm going to be very clear about who I think is the, are the actual perpetrators in the global warming story, which is the international extraction companies. 
that make huge profits off the catastrophe and um, obfuscate and obscure the facts about the effects of their business. But here I want to think about the complexities of responsibility that we indeed do bear. I've spoken of these in earlier chapters, how Emmanuel Levinas compares our situation to the manslaughterers who all live in the cities of refuge <coughs> because our casual purchases, our casual consumptions, our casual use of the world leads inadvertently, but inevitably, ends up leading to a series of events that leads to the death of others. This narrative at the Talmud pushes us further. Even one inaction, our inability to see, our avoiding the eye of the homeless, the hungry man we rush about, we rush past in the city, needs to be expatiated by a blood sacrifice. Our little bits are little, to be sure, even trivial, but they are part of the world that turns away the poor and does not see their deaths. This is a hard problem for an ethicist, the moral problem of being. The question is Levinas asked repeatedly, is it righteous to be when being itself always consumes the world bit by little bit, always more for me, always less for the other? Part three. Books about the tipping points when the man worrying, when the man worrying, uh, worrying about geological or physical factors in global warming will suddenly start um, start an uh, unstoppable cascade always described the Atlantic Mediodono overturning circulation, AMOC, change as one of the most important. The AMOC is the ocean circulation system in the North Atlantic, which begins in the warm waters of the Caribbean, the Gulf Stream, and then runs north along the east coast of the United States, across the top of the Atlantic where the water cools and drops to the ocean bottom and runs along to Africa, where it warms as it travels back to the Caribbean again. This current is part of the thermohaline circulation, a system of current that regulates vast systems of climate dynamics. In 2015, a study suggested that the AMOC had weakened by 15 to 20% over the last 50 years. In 2021, this speculation was confirmed in a new paper. A tipping in climate change is threshold conditions where a small final change pushes the system into a completely different physical sta state. The whole North Atlantic ecosystem is adapted to the existence of this overturning circulation, which really sets the conditions, the seasonal cycle, the temperature, the nutrient conditions in the North Atlantic. And so the intricate web of the Atlantic ecosystem will be substantially disrupted if we allow such a massive change in the ocean circulation to happen. Research suggests the collapse of the AMOC could itself trigger other tipping points. A collapse of the AMOC may well induce causal interactions like changes in the El Nino Southern Oscillation, characteristics die, back, um, characteristics die back of the Amazon rainforest and shrinking of the West Antarctic ice sheets due to the seesaw effect, southern migration and large warming of the Southern Ocean. The new report was important for two reasons. It showed that the models for climate prediction were then borne out by evidence. And it showed how much closer to disaster the system had come. The entire agricultural productivity of Britain and Europe, as well as the fisheries, meaning the food supply for millions, not to mention the social and cultural productive, productive of centuries, is based on a stable and relative to the latitude, mild climate that is secondary to ocean currents. Now we seem to be far away from the Talmudic story. I'm thinking of this as an example of our situation for several reasons. First, because the concept of a changing current is exactly the sort of far away, vast hyper object that allows each of us to imagine that it's not our problem. Second, because the conveyor belt has been has stopped before and therefore could again, and this stop could last for hundreds of years, long after mitigation effects. And finally, because it's an example of how warming affects melting, which affects the salinity and temperature um, near Greenland, which affects the entire heat exchange cycle, setting in place a long chain of events in the Amazon and in the Sahal that will, that will look like, like contingency, but of course will not be contingency at all. First, you don't see the hungry man, so you don't offer him food. Perhaps he does not even ask, so he walks out of town, and then this and then that, and then he is in the place where he can be seized and killed, or you don't see the reason this act or that will lead to this act or that and then to the melting of the Arctic. The death will happen a long way away and a long time away from the first act. And someone will say, how unlucky. We seem to be so far from the problem and so small. We are just passengers on the train. We're not driving. We're just random people who live in a random way. We're not even proximate to the dead guy. We just had the bad luck to be on the train or living in that city or busy with our little carbon emitting life. 
Why should we need to atone or feel guilty for something we cannot see, a hungry homeless man, and cannot hear his mortal cries for help? Margaret Urban Walker, commenting on the Bernard Williams article, notes this complexity. The problem of moral luck resides in a sense of the persuasive general beliefs about the conditions for moral responsibility are at odds with our actual common practices of moral assessment in cases involving an element of luck. Common belief is said to endorse the principle, a control condition, that factors due to luck are no proper object of moral assessment and no proper determinant of it either, as Williams says, or more simply that people cannot be morally assessed for what is due to factors beyond their control, as Nagel argues. Yet common practice shows that uncontrolled ha happenstance indeed figures in the assessment of, of particular sorts of cases. What is said to be about the differential moral assessment of cases where the difference is an element due to luck. Walker considers several responses to what Williams and Nagel call a paradox, including Nussbaum's turn to moral luck in Greek thought. Nussbaum uses the stories of Greek texts much as I use the Talmud. And she does it to comment on the pervasiveness of the wish to deny certain moral vulnerability in a philosophic question as old as the Western tradition. For Walker, it is not a paradox, but a condition of being human. And that means that our condition is mired in moral luck, for we are what, he, what she calls impure agents, agents of rather than outside the world of space, time, and, and casuistry, agents whose histories and actions belong to it. In the sense, she says, that one can indeed make judgments, for moral agents impure to the bone ought to, be, ought to be aware of it, and aware of the deep and extensive connections between our causal inextricability and the moral significance of our response to it. We are capable of judgment for the full range of responses, including the turning away. We are, we are faced in this understanding with moral tests. For Walker, these are occasional, vivid, and rare, but I would agree, rather, that they are the constancy of life's work. It is always a moral test. Every action leaving the trace, the prints of the grasping hand, and this is true even when the agent is unaware of his or her very agency. Our entanglement in the causality of the world is hard to sort indeed. As Walker notes, all agents are impure and we're the sort of impure agents that fail but have to act in situations of extremely bad luck and to do so requires virtues of impure agency, namely integrity, lucidity, grace, and dependability. And so one keeps a moral core in the face of bad luck. Whatever the challenge, we consider them worthy of respect if they are able to stand and respond in terms that will embody ongoing moral commitments or such new ones as may be required. Walker and Williams and Nagel constantly refer to ordinary life that is marked by some unlucky challenges. What I am suggesting in this chapter is somewhat more, something more alarming. I think it is that ordinary life is a fantasy for the way we live now. We're in the middle of a building crisis, one that threatens to tip over into full-born tragedy with every act and every refusal to act. It is not my fault entirely, each of us can say, and that will be sort of true. You, reader, are not likely to be the guy with the ax in your hand sneaking around murderously, but you are the one who walks with very bad luck to take the train that kills people and then has the very bad luck to live in a society that has precipitated a crisis of the climate so that the skies are filled with smoke and the record rainfall floods your rivers and record droughts shrivel the corn in the fields to whispering husks and far away from you a current in the ocean shudders and falters. It is not a philosophical paradox, it is a theopolitical reality and that is why it needs a theological response. Absolve, O Lord, your people Israel, whom you redeemed, and do not let guilt for the blood of the innocent man remain among your people Israel. For Hannah Arendt, the capacity for agency that Walker means, and that needs absolution, is created in the most personal space of all, in the private conversation between one in one's inner selves, the deep inner dialogue she calls thinking, meaning, judging. She says, the precondition for this kind of judging is not a highly developed intelligence or sophistication in moral matters but rather, with rather the deposition to live together explicitly with oneself, to have intercourse with oneself. That is to be engaged in that silent dialogue between me and myself, which since Socrates and Plato, we usually call thinking. This kind of thinking, though at the root of all philosophic thought, is not technical and is not concerned theoretical problems. The dividing line between those who want to think and therefore have to judge themselves and those who do not 
strikes across all social and cultural and educational differences. Arendt is talking about the situation into which she and the Germans of her time found themselves extremely bad, mortally bad luck, and worse, the worst luck of the 20th century. And each person would have to decide how to live, whether to collaborate or turn away or resist. To put it crudely, she said, they refused to murder, not the, the, the good guys, not so much because they still held fast to the command, thou shall not kill, but because they were unwilling to live together with a murderer themselves. Arendt is not only speaking here of the Germans who ran death camps and ran the apparatus of the state, she was more interested in the bystanders who simply did nothing, overwhelmed by the enormity of the risk of speaking out, or just wanting to avoid politics, who simply lived their German lives until the very end, not protesting as the death camps rolled on inexorably when they should have found a way to refuse to participate. She reminds us that each one did not bear their own guilt. It is, it is not the fault of the system or the state or history or luck. It is a failure of the individual who has not heard her own conscience and has not seen the face of the other, but sends the other to her death, an unseen, anonymous, abandoned person between two cities. It's the argument of this chapter that we cannot avoid the gaze of the other without cost and without blood guilt when we do not refuse to murder. We know that saying we don't want to be too political, we who live after the Shoah, is not a credible excuse. We know that saying that you did not see the stranger's face, for we who now have read this Talmud piece, is also not a credible excuse. For when near to us and far from us, we are responsible for the other, the one who we do not see and do not hear, the one who lives on the other side of the vast ocean, the one who we speed by on our train. And I'm gonna end this chapter by returning to the calf. We no longer have the ritual of the broken neck calf. The Gomorrah goes on to tell us, because anonymous murders have become too common. The Gomorrah says, the Mishnah further states from the time when murder is proliferated, the ritual of the heifer whose neck was broken was nullified. The ritual was performed only when the identity of the murderer was completely unknown. Once there were many known murderers, the conditions for the performance of the ritual were no longer present as the probable identity of the murderer was known. From the time when Eliezer ben Dene, who was also called Tahina ben Parisha, came, they renamed him son of a murderer. This is an example of a publicly known murderer. Once the identity of the murderer is clear and the land is full up with known murderers, you need to go after them. You need to get them. And this is the topic of my next chapter in the book, which forthcoming book, where we ask the question, what do we do when we know the names of the murderers? Thank you. Now I have time for questions. Thank you for a fascinating presentation, Lori. And I think Ruben has an announcement regarding the next installment.